Hi everybody, welcome back to Rachel's studio and I am going to build on my first session. I put out to you all my first in the fur series, how to paint fur. And in that first session, remember we talked about basic terms. So now you will know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about tea, milk, cream consistency, wet, dry, buckling paper, all that good stuff. So today I thought we would focus on 10 different fur types and how I painted them. Also, keep something in mind. Whether you're painting grass or fur or who knows what else, a lot of the same painting principles will apply. So you may have come to learn about how to paint, say, a long-haired cat, but just know that the same principles that apply to painting that cat also apply to a long-haired dog or a lion or long grass in a meadow. And by the way, I do recommend that you watch my how to paint grass video. I'll link it here because just change the color and you have a lot of cool ideas about how to paint fur. I would encourage you to watch all the different animals I paint in this video, even if you're only interested in, in one because you'll learn basic painting principles as you watch this entire video, as you will any of my tutorials that I do. And remember, I did break everything up in chapters, so if you do want to skip to something you're interested in, you can do that easily by hovering over the timeline. Before we get started on painting the different fur types, I want to show you how to do an underpainting. What is an underpainting? An underpainting is something I use a lot underneath my fur layers, and it's almost always the first stage in my painting. Wow, this is getting bright. I would say about 80% of the time when I'm painting a furry friend, I start with an underpainting. And what you do to decide what color you want your underpainting to be is look at the color of your animal. Are they a black lab? Then probably your underpainting is going to be blue and purple. Is it a golden retriever? Then probably your underpainting is going to be a yellow or a really watered down burnt sienna with a little yellow added is your painting of a brown tabby cat like say this this is a project that if it works out i'll share on my patreon but if it doesn't i will not <laughs> but what color do you see underlying all the dark colors to me i see a lot of yellow so again for this tabby cat i think i would well i did choose a yellow underpainting and here's my yellow underpainting. And then for a white animal, it totally depends on a white animal's environment. If they are in an environment that's making them kind of glow yellow and orange, that's your underpainting. If, they have a, if they're inside, a lot of times they'll have a lot of blues and purples, and your first underpainting is blue or purple. And for an underpainting, you use tea consistency paint, very watery, lots of water added, and try to keep your underpainting changing in color a little bit. And sometimes your reference photo will give you that information because the colors change as the shadows and the light and the fur changes across the planes and the contours of the animal. So look at your reference photo because it might help you with that too. The more you can keep your colors changing in an underpainting, the more interesting your ultimate painting will be. So that's your underpainting and you let that underpainting completely dry and then after that, you go on to the next stages we're going to talk about and put some actual fur textures in. Another way that I often start a painting is to paint the whole animal with clear water and then use a technique called charging to get the first layer. That's another way I often do an underpainting. I paint the whole fur area with clear water and then I take different colors and charge them into that wet paint to develop my underpainting. For example, here I'm going to paint a long furred cat. And by the way, when you watch me do these demonstrations, just look at these lessons in terms of learning general techniques that you can then take and apply to your very specific painting situation. And I try to do that so that I just give you general ideas of how to approach different problems and then take those ideas and use them in your own painting of whatever it is you want to paint. So here you see me mixing up the oranges for this glistening level cat. She's very wet and she's a long-haired cat so I want everything to look really soft in this first application. So here you'll see me mixing up between milk and cream consistency paint and there on the eyebrows that were very uh, pronounced in the reference photo, I use really thick cream consistency paint, but because I'm painting onto wet paper, glistening paper, 
everything still looks nice and soft like cat fur should. If I painted this on dry paper, everything would have a hard edge and it would be very jarring to the eyes. And if you are painting on really wet paper, you don't want it puddling, but glistening, maybe a little bit drier than super glistening, and you just have to experiment to get a feel for it. But when you paint with cream consistency paint on that level of moisture on your paper, you get really nice dark passages, but they stay, they also stay soft. And you know they say in watercolor, start with your lighter colors and work to your darks. But here you can see I'm putting in some of my darkest darks and I'm just making sure that I, I get those darks exactly where they are in the reference photo and they kind of serve as a map. So you can go ahead and put your darks in. You can charge them in to this glistening clear water. And if you paint with cream consistency, the paint will hold its shape and stay where you want it to. So here you notice I'm getting some light colored fur, I'm getting some medium colored fur and dark colored fur. And the darker the paint, the creamier it is, the less water in my paint. And the lighter passages are just painted with tea consistency paint. So this is a separate example of how to start your underpainting in a very different approach. And there's 10 zillion different ways to do the same thing in watercolor. So I'm just gonna give you some examples. After you have your underpainting complete, you can start working on the actual fur textures. Let's look at a few different kinds. First, let's look at the hardest one for me to do is a poodle's fur. When I painted this poodle for my friend, I painted it mostly on dry paper because the fur has so much structure. Let's look a little bit at how I did this poodle's fur. So here down on his cheek, his furs are longer and I'm painting negatively. There's a ton of negative painting. He's got a lot of light furs with dark areas in between them. So you paint the dark areas in between the fur to create the texture of the fur. It's almost like sculpting, like you're cutting out the fur instead of painting the fur in. And then on these curlier areas, I paint negatively around the cups of the curls. And again, I'm, I'm, it's almost like I'm carving the fur out of the paper and leaving the light areas, the fur, and painting the dark shadows in between the furs. And then on his snout, where it's a lot lighter, I use tea consistency. On the right side of the dog, my paint strokes are have thicker, creamier, cooler color with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue mixed together. And then on the left side where the light is hitting the dog, it's lighter colors with more burnt sienna, maybe a little yellow mixed in. All right, for the second kind of fur I want to explore is short cat face hairs or short, really short hairs in a small area, especially the, the face area of a cat because those hairs are really short. And a lot of times what I'll do is, especially on the nose, I'll actually pat them on with my finger, like you see here. One way that I've painted is with a rigger. And here is some footage of me painting a black cat. I've got my underpainting done, and now I'm building up successive layers of fur on the face to create fur textures, and I follow the current of the fur with my wet on dry technique. Here, uh, I'm painting on perfectly dry paper. It does have paint underneath it, and I'm just making very small little textural effects. And a lot of times I'll paint a lot of fur details around the eyes because I know the viewer will be looking in those areas. And then in areas that are further away from the eyes, I don't have to put as much texture because the viewer is not gonna spend a lot of time scrutinizing every hair in the animal. So you don't have to paint every single fur. And in fact, if you do, it's gonna look overwhelming to the human eye and it's gonna look stilted because the human brain wants to figure things out. And if you leave things unpainted, the human brain will fill it in as if it was really there and it will make it look more beautiful to the viewers. Just how the human brain works. Next, let's look at medium fur dogs like labs and lab mixes. One of the first things you may notice in this painting is that I'm not doing much of an underpainting in the shoulders. I'm starting with a dry brush technique, which yields marks that have sparkles of pure white scattered among the dark brown paint. This is Kenobi and his fur was lit up by the sun and I wanted to accentuate that with a dry brush technique. So you can see when I mix this paint, it's somewhere between milk and cream consistency. 
I'm using burnt sienna, and in the redder areas, I've added a little naphthol red, and in the more chocolate shaded areas, I've added ultramarine blue. Where the brown chest hairs meet the white chest hairs, I use the tip of my brush to simulate the longer furs you can see in this area. And notice, I don't paint it in a regular pattern. I look closely at my reference and then emulate the jagged pattern. I see beginners make this common mistake, painting furs in too regular pattern. I call it fur gate. <laughs> Let me show you what I mean for a second. So this is a painting I did of Hummer and I painted this 20 years ago in 2004. I used masking, which is liquid plastic, and I'll link here for those of you who don't know what masking is, because you can use masking to create fur textures. But I used masking to save the whites of the paper along his chest, and you can see that I painted the masking in a gate-like pattern, perfectly even along his chest hairs. Don't do that. <laughs> So I would love to repaint this painting now with all my 20 years of painting experience and show you guys how I would do it now. But check out what I'm talking about here. Look how his chest is evenly spaced out. His chest furs are evenly spaced out. Don't do that. You want to have a lot of variety and texture. So instead of having fur, 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 you want fur, 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 fur. It's almost like music when you're painting. As this area progresses, I will let the first layer dry, then go in with a second layer of fur texture as needed. The fur closer in the middle of the chest is in shadow, so I decided to do a second layer of cooler or bluer fur there. I paint negatively around the rings of his collar, and painting negatively, remember, is when you paint the air around an object, not the object itself. And then you'll see me moving on to put another layer of fur glaze on the first layer of paint that is dried on the face. There are lots of little shapes in the face. For example, there are triangles of fur above the eyes. Whenever possible, you want to look for these shapes in the anatomy of the animal you're painting and paint those shapes instead of thinking in terms of painting individual furs. And here you'll see me put a third layer of chocolate color fur on this area. If you look at the reference, you'll see that this is a dark shadowed area. So it will need at least two, but probably three or four successive layers of glaze. Remember, you paint a layer of fur glaze and let it dry. Paint another layer, let it dry, and so on. Until you have built your fur layers up so that it's a good level of color, value, and fur complexity that you need. This is true no matter what animal you're painting. Also, grass. <laughs> so, uh, and a lot of different other things like rock texture. Now let's watch as I paint Donnie, a long-haired toy mix dog. Here I have my paper glistening and I'm painting with very thick cream consistency paint using a mix of burnt sienna and Holbein Oriol and for the more yellow areas or warmer areas and burnt sienna mixed with ultramarine blue for the cooler, bluer chocolate brown areas. Notice how I paint the large shapes like the sideways half moons of the eyebrows and here the long arcs of ear fur. I follow the contours of the hairs and let them dictate what kind of strokes I make, whether I make long arcs or wavy curved clumps of fur. Notice also that I listen to what my reference photo tells me to do and intermix strokes of darker brown with more orange burnt sienna passages in the ears. Try to vary the colors with each new brush stroke you make and rely on your reference to tell you what colors to interchange with each stroke. Now I'm going to work in the long furs that are curvy along the side of the face. I'm still working on damp paper and that's why my fur looks so soft. As my paper gets a little too dry, I'll give it a spray or two with a misting sprayer or a spray bottle to keep everything just the right level of damp. In this area, there are upside down V's of wavy fur clumps, so I paint those shapes as I see them in my reference. You will notice I did accentuate some of the curves and waves to add aesthetic appeal. Curving shapes are more interesting artistically than straight lines, so accentuate the curves in both your animal and fur when you can. As I get to the end of the painting process, for Donnie, I work with smaller brushes and put a few details on dry paper, especially the face where I want the most details. Remember, put the most details in the area where you want the viewer to rest their gaze the longest. This means you will use smaller brushes and drier paper in those areas when painting that part of the process. Just remember to not overdo these small details that I call jewelry. 
And of course, I've got a whole video to explain what jewelry is and I'll link it here. Remember, when you click on these links, they will not take you out of this tutorial. They'll just put it in a queue for you to watch later. Okay, let's do long-haired cats. They are one of my favorite things to paint. I find it a fun and interesting challenge to try to get that soft, fluffy, cloud-like fur beautifully rendered. Back to our long-haired cat though. First, I get the whole cat wet to the glistening stage. Here I'm using my favorite lamp black because of its qualities to fur out more beautifully than any other watercolor paint I know of. I've talked about this a lot. In fact, in Hacks 3, I think it was Hacks 3, I did a special section on what makes lamp black paint so special. I have a whole playlist of my Hacks videos, so I'll link those here. You'll also see me spraying my paper as the paper dries so that my paper stays wet enough for the paint to bloom, which simulates long, fluffy fur perfectly. The wetter the paper, the more the paint blooms. Notice also that I let the burnt sienna colors and lamp black merge softly so there are no hard edges between paint colors. You'll see me using another one of my favorite techniques to create fur textures here too, using my finger to swipe it across the wet paint, creating a furry edge. I also often will blot at edges to smush them and make them look more natural. I keep building up the fur as much as possible until my paper dries to the buckling stage, at which point I'll splat it with some water to get those atmospheric blooms you see in the black fur. But then you do need to let it dry completely, and if there is more wet and wet fur that needs to be done, you just repeat the process, repainting over everything with clear water, get it back to the glistening stage, and then you can go back to painting wet and wet until you have all the soft blooming fur painted in. Let's look at how I painted a short-haired cat now, in this case, a Siamese cat. I want to explain this cat in a little bit of a different way than the other animals. When you're painting fur, think in terms of the fact that you are telling the story of the fur as a painter. You don't have to tell every detail, just the important parts. In this Siamese cat, I focused on a few areas that tell the story of the fur to be a bit more detailed, and the rest is soft and impressionistic. Look where the dark ears meet the lighter fur of the face. There is a jagged border between them that really describes the fur nicely. This is the place that tells the story of the fur, how long it is and what direction it grows, say better than on the chest, where even in the reference photo, everything is blurred together and you really can't see the individual furs. So I chose to take advantage of that high contrast area which gives it instant importance anyway, just because the contrast will draw the viewer's eye. So this is another reason why we should pay extra attention to how we render the fur in this area. The high contrast area will draw the viewer's eye. So when I painted that fur area, I paid attention to what I was doing and I waited until the paper reached the perfect level of paper moisture. I do this a lot. I'll work on glistening painting, letting it dry as I paint, then when it's at just the right level of moisture before it gets too dry, I'll paint my most important areas that need to be the perfect amount of dampness to get the perfect amount of softness yet controlled softness. So here I've gotten to that stage. The ears are buckling damp, a little bit more wet than buckling, but not much. I mix some cream consistency lamp black and ultramarine blue in a delicate rigor size zero brush so I can paint with good detail and precision. If you get a few bits of the story of the painting right, the viewer's eye will believe the rest of the story elsewhere in the painting even if it's very vague. And indeed, I left most of the rest of the cat quite soft and impressionistic by painting on fairly damp paper and I kept everything soft and undetailed. A Siamese cat looking straight at us with those piercing light blue eyes set in a dark fur frame grab the viewer's attention and the fur doesn't need a lot of detail except in a few important spots like the base of the ears and chin maybe. The rest of the markings on the face are done mostly in a straightforward way by painting with milky tea consistency burnt sienna and ultramarine blue to get a more chocolate color. Then I'll soften the edges with a damp brush. Let's watch me explain this part in real time. Now this is a pretty hard line, so it's pretty dry. So I'm going to go in with a clear water brush. I just put clear water on my paintbrush and I'm just dipping along those edges to soften them up. All right, next let's do super short dog fur. And by the way, even if you're painting a horse or some other very short furred animal like a horse, the same principles will apply to how I paint this dog. So to paint this kind of fur, 
Often I'll just focus on the values as they change across the topography of the animal. For this dachshund, I painted an underpainting of yellow and burnt sienna and let it dry. Then I rewet it with clear water and charged the darker areas with cream consistency burnt sienna. Remember, charging is a technique where you get an area wet with clear, clean water and then you charge it or drop in paint. And that paint will spread out in the wet area beautifully and softly merging beautifully with colors that you put next to each other. So here I could see the fur was blooming out a bit too much, which means either my paper or my brush has too much water. In this case, I squeezed the heel of my brush with a paper towel, which I do often to get excess water out of my brush, which gives a lot more control over the paint in my brush. Watch how the paint blooms a lot less after I squeeze the extra water out of the heel of my brush. The tip of my brush had cream consistency paint, but the heel had too much water. So remember, I squeezed the heel while my brush had cream consistency paint in the tip and it gave me a lot more control. I'll do that a lot. I'll pick up color on my palette and then I'll squeeze the heel of my brush with paper towel so that then when I touch my brush to the paper, the paint does not explode out of my brush and make a big mess on my paper. Also, notice when I paint the belly of this little guy, I carry the paint right over to the back of the bigger dog. In my tutorials, I talk about the importance of attaching the subject to the background, in this case, the bigger dog, so the animal doesn't look like a cutout. And as you start to think like an artist, you'll paint shapes instead of animals, and parts of the big dog merge with parts of the little dog because where they meet are the same value or darkness. So you paint it as if they are one thing, as if there is no boundary there. That is a secret to a painterly, loose-looking outcome. But let's not get too far off the first subject. I'm good at doing that, so sorry, not sorry. <laughs> I'm now gonna build up the values or darker colors on the body of the dog. I'm mixing some milky cream consistency paint and putting a line of dark burnt sienna just through the middle of the dog's body and hind end because that's what my reference photo is telling me to do. I get it even darker brown with a little added ultramarine blue around the ears, which also really helps to serve to pop out the architecture of the ears. Luckily, my reference photo just gave me those values that really help define this little dog. So notice in this little guy, I never do go in to paint fur wispies. His short coat doesn't call for it, so I keep everything smooth by always painting on moist paper so the darker values keep soft margins and just look like the contours of his muscles. Next, let's look at striped fur. This can be complicated. It doesn't have to be. I'd actually love to experiment with striped tabby cat fur with watercolor pencils. I'm sure that will be an upcoming video, but for now, I'll share with you how I did the stripes of this cat. By the way, this full real-time step-by-step tutorial is available for free here on my YouTube channel, complete with downloadable traceable, and I'll link it here. Just be warned, I made the tutorial early in my online teaching days, and I've come a long way, baby, if I do say so myself. <laughs> but anyway, there are a zillion different ways to paint tabby stripes, and I love experimenting with new approaches every single time I paint a tabby. But here's one approach. So just know there are many ways to paint a cat like this. So first, I got the whole cat wet with clear water to the glistening stage, being careful to sop up any puddles of clear water. Note too how I start with a big brush on more wet paper, and by the end of the cat painting, I'm working on dry paper with a tiny brush. My first brush stroke you see is very thick, cream consistency paint on wet paper. And notice I use more than one color too. Notice how with each successive brush stroke, I change the color. Up into the face, I go quite milk consistency yellow with just a little burnt sienna mixed into it. Remember, the lighter the color, the more water you've added to your paint. Also notice as the paper dries, my stripes bloom out less and less. This is your paper talking to you, telling you it's the perfect time to look at your reference, find the most defined small tiny stripes that need to be painted and go ahead and paint those with cream consistency paint. Once the paper gets to the buckling stage, you will have to stop, let everything dry and set, and then re-wet if you still have more stripes to paint. Also, if you use my push technique to enhance your stripes, you can do it during the buckling stage. That's a whole nother video though, and I'll link to my video that I made about the push technique. 
You can see that my solution to drawing paper is to paint the haunches with milk consistency paint and then I spray to loosen things up. Later on in the painting, I want to add dark details to some of the stripes. So I take a much smaller brush with a good tip, like a rigger or size four round and paint milk consistency black fur textures on dry paper. Then I get even darker cream consistency black paint to put a darker stripe in and work here and there throughout the painting to put a few fur textures in. You can see I go back to tea consistency burnt sienna and put a few fur textures in. When these watery glazes dry, they will leave a nice subtle fur texture that isn't overpowering. Note that I just paint a few fur textures here and there. If I get too literal and paint a ton of fur texture, this painting will lose its dreamy painterly style and get too stiff looking. All right, next let's focus on brindled fur. Let's go back to our cute little cuddle friends, this time to explore how to paint brindle fur a little more in depth. I'll show you a few clips of how I did this dog's brindled fur. Just remember, you paint in many layers until you get to the complexity, to the level that looks right for your particular painting and subject. So after the initial underpainting has dried, I can start on the darker brown brindling. Also keep in mind, if you get some dark brindling in and then you decide the underlying coat color is still too light, you can let everything dry, let it set, and do another large glaze or wash over the entire area, all the brindling, to get everything a little darker or a different leaning color hue with a tea consistency glaze. I do that all the time and often it does the double duty of also softening everything in general in that area just a little so it looks more appealing. So the heart of this technique is to paint on dry paper with a very dry brush. Cream consistency paint in your brush. You may even need to pick up paint in your brush, then squeeze out the heel of your brush with paper towel as I described in an earlier section. Being careful not to touch the tip and then apply the dry on dry technique. So here I'm using my three quarter oval and at some points you'll also see me scrubbing with my finger over the painted surface to enhance the brindling effect. Often you'll get the best texture if you paint with the side of your brush as opposed to the tip of your brush. Here I have more of a pure burnt sienna mix on my brush and I've splayed the bristles of my silver black velvet to get even more texture out of my brush. Keep in mind that you won't be able to do that with a synthetic brush, but you could also use a stencil brush or a found object to create brindle texture. Also try dabbing on paint with your finger. That can be a great way to get brindle textures and fur textures in general. All right, I kept the best, most fun fur to paint for last, leopard spots. Painting leopard spots can be a great way to practice wet on wet technique because you'll learn just how wet your paper needs to be, just how thick your paint needs to be to get just the right amount of bloom you want. And also, as a side note, I often do a test when I'm painting with a cream consistency paint on wet paper. I'll I'll load my brush up with cream consistency paint and then touch it to my wet paper and watch how much it blooms. And depending on what happens, I'll know if I need to let my paper dry a little bit more or if it's ready to paint the perfect amount of soft spots. Also keep in mind that the larger format you work in, the more your spots will have room to bloom and the more painterly and dreamy they will look. Also, I love to paint spots with Daniel Smith Lamp Black because it furs out the most and it also has the smallest drying shift, meaning that it stays dark even after it dries. It's a common problem for black to lighten a lot as it dries and Daniel Smith has one of the least drying shifts I've found for black. Remember, a drying shift is how much a paint lightens and grays as it dries. And so Daniel Smith has a really small drying shift. For this particular leopard, I got the whole animal wet, then I drop in my underpainting. I continue to work on the painting, dropping in tea consistency paint and building up the base yellow fur color, all the while keeping a close eye on how dry my paper is getting. I find other things to do on the painting until it's at just the right stage. I'll quickly paint as many spots as I can get away with before the paper dries to the point where my edges start getting too hard. At that point, I'll either mist my paper and keep going or let it completely dry. Then re-wet it with clear water and repeat the process to keep painting all the spots. For example, let's watch the eyebrows go in. And remember, eyebrow spots really affect the personality of how your leopard looks or any animal. So keep that in mind. Again, 
Here I am painting on a little drier than before, but still damp enough to get soft edges so my spots don't look stuck on. All right, thank you all so much for tuning in and be sure to subscribe because next week I'm gonna have another fur video. Hit that like button, it really helps my channel and hit the bell so you get notified whenever I upload a video. Go watercolor your world and I'll see you next week. Bye everybody.